two, one, two. Good evening, everyone. Am I in the light? I'm nice and bright in my fast. Anyway. Um, well, tonight we're going to do the second part of this Freedom Series. So there's been two talks last week and this week. Uh, this week uh, we're looking at um, freedom from sin in a sense. What does that actually look like? Um, whereas last week was a bit of an overview of freedom throughout the entire Bible. Um, I'm excited. I feel like uh, it's not an accident that any of you are here tonight. You're here to hear what God has to say because God wants to change you tonight. That's, that's his agenda in your life. I know that from the scriptures. And so it's no accident you're here. Um, God wants to do something. So let's ask him to do it. Let me pray. Father God, we trust you that you are a God who wants to work in this world, that you haven't just set up this salvation plan for us one day to go to this happy place, that you are here right now, that by your spirit, through your word, you are wanting to change the lives of the people here who are sitting under your word right now. And so we pray for these people and also the people who are at home, Father, that they would all be sitting under your word, listening to what you have to say, ready to change because of who you are. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Craig. Craig is a middle-aged man. Uh, he is committed to Bible study and church. Uh, he, he approaches you one afternoon uh, and he says he's struggling with pornography. He tells you that he, it's not all the time, but it's just something that it keeps happening. Every couple of weeks he falls, he slips, he starts looking at porn. He looks at you broken in the eyes and he says, I thought Christians are supposed to be free. I thought Christians are supposed to be free. You know another lady, her name is Claire. She's a part of your Bible study group as well. You spend time in prayer one night and she confesses this consistent struggle she has with anger towards this person who's hurt her deeply. She just cannot get past it. She, can't, she cannot bring herself to the place of wanting to forgive that person. She's just stuck in her angry, anger. She looks at you broken and she says to you, I thought Christians are supposed to be free. I thought Christians are supposed to be free. See, if you were with us last week, we saw that the Bible teaches that those who put their trust in Jesus have freedom, have, in a sense, ultimate freedom. Uh, freedom to be and live the way God created us to live or designed us to live best. Uh, free from sin, free from suffering, free from separation, slavery. And yet, even back last week, we talked about the fact that that reality of being free from sin isn't complete yet. That won't happen until we see Jesus in the new creation. And right now we have, well, we're still, there's still sin, still, sin's still around. But at the same time, as I said that last week, a couple of the questions came out through question time was, if Christians are so free, then why am I struggling with sin? So it's one thing to say, oh yeah, sin still remains. Yeah, I know, there's not much we can do about it. But still, you think after a couple of years that we would have really got rid of some of those sins that we think, oh, why can't I get rid of that? Why can't I get rid of that struggle with anger? Why can't I get rid of that struggle with pornography? Why can't I get rid of that struggle? Why, when I walk into a group of people, am I constantly doing that game where you're looking at others and thinking, am I better than them? <laughs> that pride game we play where we get ladders and we think, where am I on the ladder compared to them? Why do I do that? Why do, why do I get so defensive when someone asks a very simple question and I jump up like I've got to defend myself against an army coming against me? What, what, why am I still so greedy? Not greedy in the sense I run around chasing money, but I'm anxious all the time that I don't have enough. You see, if Christians are so free, then why do we have so much struggle with sin? Even the best of us. We go to church, we do all the right things. How can we still struggle with sin? Well, tonight I've got us to read Galatians chapter 5 because I think Galatians chapter 5 kind of gives us an understanding of the reality that we're living in, in this now but not yet, that we're free from sin and yet still we have sin in this world. And so for those new to the Bible, Galatians is written after the rising of the Lord Jesus, about a couple of decades after. Paul is writing a letter to a church, uh, the churches of Galatia, and, he, and in particular, he's writing it to a church that's struggling with this question of freedom. And so it's a really helpful passage to look at. Uh, the first thing he reminds them, that they've been set free from the law. Okay, so it's going to be up on the screen. You can keep your Bible open. We're going to look at chapter 5 from verse 1, set free from the law. It says this, Paul says, For freedom Christ has set us free. 
Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. Okay, so Paul is writing to average Christians, average Christians who are still free from sin and yet struggle with sin. But in particular, these churches in Galatia, they're average Christians like us. There's these people who'd come in, they're actually Jewish teachers. They'd come into this Galatian church and they'd started telling the Galatian Christians, trusting in Jesus to be saved is not enough. That if you want to be really good, if you want to really kick this whole sin issue, that you actually have to do the Jewish law as well. And in particular, you have to do circumcision, all right, in order to be right with God, in order to express obedience to God. And so from chapter 3, Paul responds to this false teaching, saying that the law never fixed the sin problem. Now, if you're new with us tonight, you don't know much about the Bible. The first half of the Bible is called the Old Testament. And, and that predominantly is about how God gives his people a, a thing called the law. And it wasn't a law in order to make them good. It was a law to show them how good they were not. <laughs> it was a law to show them how much sin there was and how much they needed a saviour. And yet these Galatian, these Jewish teachers had come in and saying, hey, you need to have the law to be free from sin. And Paul's saying, no, the law just showed us our sin. It showed us how sinful we are and it just brought condemnation. And so he's saying to the Galatians, why are you going back again and submitting to a yoke of slavery? Now, a yoke is this idea you've got two oxen, two big, two big animals, and you've got a piece of wood that goes between them and it holds them down. And so Paul is saying the law is here and you're being held down under the law because that's all the law does. It traps us in our sin. It condemns us in its sin. That's all the law can do. It can't make you sin. It can't make you stop sinning. And so Paul is saying here in Galatians chapter 5, so if you think circumcision is going to do it, then actually you need to do the whole law. And even if you do the whole law, it's still not going to do it. Because if you do the whole law, what's going to happen? If you think you can be saved by doing the law, then you'll actually sever yourself off from Christ. You'll sever yourself off from grace. So you've either got doing it yourself with works or you've got Christ and grace. Now, the Bible's really clear. There's actually two ways to reject God. Two ways to reject God. The first one's pretty obvious. You reject God by saying, God, I don't give a stuff about you. I'm going to live the way I want. You can do that actively by hating God and saying that to people and to him himself. Or you can do it passively by just ignoring him, not acting like he's there. Okay, most people do the passive. That's one way you can do it. The second way to reject God, and if you're not a follower of Jesus tonight, then you might not know this to be true, but this is actually true. You can reject God by actually doing good things. You can reject God by actually living his ways, doing the things he tells you to do in the Ten Commandments, for instance. So that doesn't make any sense to us because we think, well, God wants us to do the good things, doesn't he? But here's the deal. God says, your sin is such a big problem that you cannot do good things to get rid of it. And so my only solution, God says, is to send my son and take your place to die and for your sins and live the life that you couldn't live. And so when we say to God, God, I'm going to live a good way in order to be right with you, what we're saying is, God, I don't give a stuff about what Jesus did for me because I don't need him. I don't need Jesus. I can just do it myself. And so we can reject God not only by not living his way and ignoring him, but we can also reject God by actually living his way and saying, no, I don't need Jesus. And so Paul is saying to the Galatians, if you go back to law, okay, you are rejecting Jesus and God's offer of salvation. You're saying to God, God, I don't need Jesus. I can do it myself. Verse 5, there's another way. So that's the two ways you reject him. Here's the one you, you, way you pursue him. Verse 5, for through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. All right, so this law brought slavery and condemnation. But here's another way. That is, through faith in Jesus, trust in Jesus, enabled by the Holy Spirit, we will one day, we live with this hope of righteousness, one day we'll be made perfect. So these are two super important things to know about the Christian life. All right, first one, living by the law does not save a person. 
Salvation is not based on the things that we do, but they're based on what Jesus has done for us. It's only through trust in Jesus. That's the most, that's a significant thing. If you're not a follower of Jesus tonight, you know nothing about the Christian faith, you think it's just about doing a whole bunch of good things, know that that is a lie. It's not true. The Bible clearly says it's only through trust in Jesus, not what we do. Second, and this is for, this is for people who actually believe that to be true, I'm saved by faith, living by the law does not grow Christians either. It doesn't grow Christians. It, if you follow Jesus and you think to yourself, if you get to this point where you say, I don't have the strength and the willpower to live God's way, I don't think I'm going to be a Christian anymore. Have you ever got to that plate? You think, I, can't, I don't have it. I don't have it within me to be a follower of Jesus anymore. I've got the, the, the strength to do what he wants me to do. I can't do it. I want to suggest to you firstly that you're right. <laughs> you don't. You don't have the willpower within yourself. You don't have the strength within yourself to follow Jesus and live his way. But at the same time, you're wrong because God's never asked you to. He's never expected you to have something inside you, this willpower to make yourself more like him. No. Trying hard to live according to the law is not going to live, extinguish the sin in your life. That's not the function of the law. It was never going to do that for you. It just showed you that you were a sinner. Christians are set free from the law. Okay. Now, the question is, does that mean, and this is the question I get when I explain the gospel to people, that it's not by what we do, what Jesus has done. They say, all right, grace, that's cool. Does that mean Christians can live however they want? That's an obvious question, isn't it? It's a good question for them to ask. It means they've got it. Secondly, we are set free to love. Verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. All right, so Paul says, God calls those who trust him to freedom. Now, when I say the word calling, don't think God just says, hey guys, come over here and be free. All right, so just asking you to come over. When the word calling is used in the scriptures, it's talking about not just asking you to come, but actually enabling you to come as well, empowering you to come. And so God has, if, wait, sorry, when you put your trust in Jesus, God enabled you by the Holy Spirit to be free. He, what did he do? He opened your blind eyes so that you saw, as you read the scriptures and heard the gospel of Jesus, you realized Jesus died for me, and then you were compelled by the Holy Spirit to put your trust in him and be made perfect. And God called you. He enabled you to be free. He enabled you to free from condemnation. And here's the deal. He didn't do that. He didn't go to great lengths to do that by sending Jesus to die for you, by giving you the Holy Spirit, by making you opening your blind eyes to enable, drawing you into him he didn't do it so you could just be in heaven one day he didn't just he wasn't just handing out tickets to heaven and he said oh well, you deserve one and i'll give one to you and you'll give one he wasn't just doing that he did that he saved you he opened your blind eyes he made you a christian so that you would be set free to love others to serve others that's why you've been set free you haven't been set free, so you can just go off and do whatever you want and think, oh, it's all on the tab. God's got it covered. He has made it. He has called you to be his servant and to be serving him by loving others. You see, grace is never an excuse for not loving others. It can't be. It can't be. Because when you truly understand the grace of God, it's not that you can't sin and get away with it. Because you can, because it's covered by Jesus. It's you don't want to. You've been set free from a master that was bringing about your destruction. Why would you want to sin anymore? God has set you free for a purpose, and that is to love and serve others. And so here we are. Christians are set free from the law. We're set free to love others. And then we're stuck, but, but at the same time, we're stuck, aren't we? Because as much as these things are true, the reality is we struggle with sin, isn't it? We still struggle. And so why is living those things out such a struggle? Well, number three, 
Paul talks about we are set free in the Spirit. We're set free in the Spirit or by the Spirit. Verse 16, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Okay, I talked to you last week about the fact that God is not just a grandpa in heaven. Okay, he's not just a grandpa in heaven by himself, that he is Trinity, that is one God, three persons. And here it's speaking about God the Son, who is truly God. Paul has said, here we walk, we walk by the Spirit. He's already mentioned in verse 5 when he says, we live by the Spirit through faith. And here he's saying, we walk by the Spirit. And so that is, we don't battle sin by just trying hard to live according to God's way. The power that animate, animates, animates, animates the life of a Christian is not our will or determination or your character. The power in you, if you follow Jesus, is the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. The ha- power of the Holy Spirit is in those who trust Jesus, you receive the Holy Spirit and he empowers you. And so Paul says, you've got this power inside you, walk according to that spirit. Follow his lead. Yield to him. Allow him to direct your life. Live according to what the Holy Spirit does. He gives you new desires. When you get get saved, you go from uh, death to life. You get the Holy Spirit. He gives you a new desire to love God and love others. Paul's saying, walk according to that new desire. He gives you new wisdom found in the Word of God. So he helps you see the world the way God sees it through the Scriptures. And he says, live according to that, live according to the Scriptures. He says, the Holy Spirit gives us a new purpose. Because all of a sudden we recognise, hey, my life is not just about living for myself and what I can get. It's actually about living for God and loving Him. And so the Holy Spirit empowers you, saying, walk according to that, live like Jesus. Paul says, because if we do that, if we walk according to the Spirit, we won't live according to the flesh. Now, the flesh is the, the way of life uh, in, in, uh, in rejection of God, the way of life apart from God, the whole life. Verse 17, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. All right, so here's the reality that we understand, isn't it? Here's their experience, isn't it? There is a battle going on. You know it, don't you? You want to do the right thing, but you just struggle to do it. You know, you don't want to be angry at your friend. You want to forgive them. You don't want to deceive people. You don't want to look at porn. The battle is there. It's going on inside Christians. But what Paul is saying here is, and this is really important, it's not the good us versus the bad us. I've got this good part of my character, and I've got this bad part, and they're kind of fighting it out. No, he says here, what's the battle? The battle inside you is between the Holy Spirit, God himself in you, and the old desires we had without Christ. See, when someone becomes a Christian, lots of things change. Biggest things are you are given the Holy Spirit and he gives you new thoughts, new desires, new passions, new loves, a new way of seeing. 2 Corinthians talks about the fact you become a new creation. But at the same time, there is remaining sin in you. Now, I call it remaining sin, all right, because you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Whereas before, sin was at the heart of your character. Now you are a new creation with this experience of remaining sin. And then in the new creation, that remaining sin will be gone and you'll be revealed for who you truly are. Now, where we, get, where we find it difficult is, where does that remaining sin lie in our person? Okay, uh, because here's the thing, scripture doesn't clearly say the remaining sin lies in this part of our person. It doesn't say that our remaining sin is just caught up in our thinking. Now, I think the reason it does that is because if, if the Bible said, hey, the part, the, the part of you that still has remaining sin is your, is your thinking, then what we'd all do is think, all right, I just need to change my thoughts. We try to do it ourselves. If scripture told us that sin was just remaining in our emotions, we'd think, all right, well, we just have to be really good at controlling our emotions and, and, and curbing them, and we'd get rid of remaining sin ourselves. But scripture doesn't do that. Scripture says remaining sin pollutes every part of who you are. It pollutes every part of who you are. Now, that might sound discouraging, but look at what else this is saying. Paul says there, there's this battle within us, a battle that Paul says, that last line there, prevents us from doing the things we want to do. Now, although remaining sin might pollute all of us, listen to what this is saying. 
as a Christian, when you put your trust in Christ, the deepest part of who you are, your core essential being, is now not sinner enslaved to sin. Your core essential being is spirit-empowered person. That is, we are not sinners who occasionally live according to the spirit. We are spirit people who occasionally sin. You see? Godliness is now the norm, whereas before, sin was the norm. We are set free by the Holy Spirit supernaturally powering our lives. The core of who you are is spirit-filled person. Verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. So Paul says the Spirit-empowered person is not focused on just trying to do things themselves according to works. In fact, as you, as you keep reading here, he says that the life that marks out the flesh is the life of works. So he talks about the works of the flesh in verse 19. It is the human being that is engaging in works that, uh, that, that, that's, the, that's the old way of living, of trying to do things. And yet we, we fail, don't we? And so the works of the flesh here, he talks about sexual sins, he talks about false worship, he talks about social sins. Those who are slaves to sin are identified by their works. But he says, on the other hand, if you have the Holy Spirit, it's a completely diff different metaphor. Because he doesn't say the works of the flesh versus the works of the Spirit. He says the works of the flesh, that is the things we do within ourselves with our own will, we do it against God. But because our will is so busted, we can't do works of the Spirit. But we can, he says here, have fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit. So verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Okay. So the works of the flesh, these are the things we do that are against God. If it was just up to us, that's all we do. Versus the fruit of the Spirit, these are the things that issue as a consequence of the fact that you have the Spirit in you. Now, it's really important when you're reading Scripture not to take a metaphor and just go to town on it. You know, you can get a metaphor in Scripture and you just make it mean all sorts of wonderful things. Uh, uh, but I'm going to go for five, all right? You might think I'm pushing it, but I don't think I am because this is a metaphor that comes up in Scripture a whole bunch of different places, so I'm using that to fill in this metaphor here. Quickly, number one, Christian growth is... This, the, it's a picture of Christian growth. So Christian growth is gradual. Just like a tree bearing fruit, um, you, can't, you don't look at a tree and think, hey, I can see the fruit popping out. It happens over time and it's not a, you can't see it to the naked eye. So the Christian growth is something that's gradual that you're not going to see. And so you think to yourself, oh, wait a minute, I was so impatient five years ago, but now I seem to have more patience than I ever had. And you had, no, don't remember at any one point ever seeing that, but all of a sudden you're there. So it's gradual. Number two, it's inevitable. Because Christian growth is not the consequence of our will and our character, because it is the power, the work of the Spirit, then it is inevitable that you will grow. See, there is no place for Christians who have God's spirit to say, I could never change, so that could never change. There's no place for us to say, it's a personality thing, I'm always going to be like that. It's a temperament thing, I'm always going to be like that. It's a family trait, we're just like that, us people. I'm the third child, I'm always going to be like that. It's a genetic thing. It's, there's no place for us to say, I'll never be able to love that person. Yes, it's gradual. Yes, it could take many years. But if you have the Spirit of God, then God can change that. God can change that. It's inevitable. Number three, Christian growth is internal. Just as the fruit for a tree comes from the nutrients of, of the soil and, and the tree, Christian growth is empowered by the Spirit inside us and, and then leads to actions outside of us. And so look at the list here, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, internal characteristics that, that bear the fruit of behaviours and words. And so Christian growth is different. It's not that we do good things to change us on the inside, we are changed on the inside and that issues in fruit. Okay, it issues in fruit. We're changed from the inside out. Number four, Christian growth is relational. Notice here the virtues that are spoken about here, they are done in the, with, with people. And so last week I got the question about can you, would, would it be better off going into a monastery and hanging out by ourselves in order to fix the problem of sin? And the answer is no. 
because the Christian growth, what it actually looks like is it's done in relationships. It's done in the messiness and the yuckiness and the difficulty of actually trying to love others and being loved by them. Christian growth is relational. Number five, Christian growth is singular. Uh, the word there for fruit, so it says the fruit of the Spirit. The word there in the Greek for fruit is singular. So it's effectively what Paul is saying is the fruit of the Spirit is love, semicolon, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. And so what it's saying is you can't love someone and at the same time saying, but I have no patience for them. <laughs> Ever said that about a person? I love them, but I just, so, I just have no patience for them at all. Or I love that person, but I, I don't really want to seek peace with them. Or, I don't have self-control. If you love them, you have patience, you have self-control. That's what love looks like. And so Christian growth is gradual, it's inevitable, it's internal, it's relational, it's singular. And it's Paul, at the end, he says, against such things, there is actually no law. Now, what he means by this is, the law was never able to pull that off. You cannot change from the inside out through the law. You needed Jesus to change from the inside out. It could never produce the fruit. So verse 24, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If today you trust Jesus, then the moment you did that, the moment you trust in Jesus, you are not, your life was united with his. And just as Jesus was crucified, so your old life without God was crucified with Jesus and he died with it, or the whole life. Verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. He says, that life is dead. It got crucified with Jesus. When you put your trust in him, you were united to him, it died. But now you live a new life by the Spirit. And so Paul says, live according to the new life. Live according to the Spirit. Walk according to that Spirit. Live as the new people you are. Not competing one another, but serving one another in love. Christians enjoy freedom in Christ as we love others empowered by the Spirit. That's kind of the main idea tonight. Christians enjoy freedom in Christ as we love others empowered by the Spirit. So if tonight, both here and the people at home over, over um, Facebook Live, if tonight you are not a follower of the Lord Jesus, then let me make it very crystal clear what this passage is saying about your current state, about where you are. You are a slave to sin. You might not recognise it. You might think to yourself, I can do good things most of the time. You might think, to, I, I, I try to live God's way and I do a whole bunch of good things. But unless you have the Spirit of God setting you free, you are stuck in the old life. You're stuck in the flesh. You will never be able to change from the inside out. You might be able to do stuff on the outside, do good behaviours, even try to think good things. You might be able to try and live by the Ten Commandments. But only Jesus will change you from the inside out. Only Jesus enables you to love God truly and love others purely. If you tonight are someone who doesn't know Jesus, then let me just say, come, come to him. He wants to change you from the inside out. He wants to give you his Holy Spirit. You just need to cry out and ask. Come to him and ask. But if you are tonight a follower of the Lord Jesus, if you're a Christian who is struggling with pride, if you're a Christian who is sitting there tonight and struggling with pornography, if you're a Christian who's struggling there tonight with anger, unforgiveness, uh, impatience, uh, lack of kindness, lack of mercy, if you're struggling with greed, if you're constantly worried about your financial position and whether you're going to have enough, even though you probably shouldn't be because you've got plenty. If you're, if you're struggling with lying and deceiving others, you're always kind of shady and shifty trying to get out of things. And you just can't, you just feel overwhelmed by it. Then you need to hear what this passage is saying. First, you cannot fix it yourself. You cannot fix it yourself. You cannot just think, I'm going to try hard to do the good things to fix my sin problem myself. Even if the good things you do are things like the things we tell you to do all the time. The things like pray, read the Bible, and be accountable to others, go to church, go to Bible study. If you do those things, which are really good things, and we're going to talk in a moment about how you should do them rightly, but if you do those things thinking to yourself, these are the things I'm going to do to work my sin off, then it's you going, in a sense, back to your own law. It's not the Ten Commandments, but you made up your own law. You made up your own disciplines to try and fix the sin problem. 
but effectively you're saying to God, I don't really need your grace. I don't really need your Holy Spirit because I can just do these things to fix the sin problem. See, Paul is saying fruit only comes through trust in Jesus made possible through the Spirit, through that relationship enabled by the Holy Spirit. And so that's why John, Jesus says in John 15, 5, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. See, it's only through relationship with Jesus that we grow. Christians don't grow by just trying to live according to a certain bunch of moral virtues. Christian growth is relational growth. It's the fruit of relationship. And so, yes, we're going to read the Bible. Don't hear me saying, don't read the Bible. Kurt said, don't bother reading the Bible, don't have to. No, read the Bible, but not as some good work as, as if it's going to, if I do this discipline, then all of a sudden I'm not going to have a struggle with porn. No, read the Bible to get to know Jesus more deeply, to grow in your love for him and, say, and see how beautiful he is so that when you go to look at pornography, you think, man, why would I want to do that when Jesus is so awesome? Why would I live, live for this temporary little delight when I have so much delight in him? So we read his word to have relationship with him, to enjoy him. Don't, yes, we're going to pray. Don't hear me saying, don't, well, Kurt said we don't have to pray. Pray, but not as some discipline that think if, if I do this, then it's going to somehow magically stop me from sinning. No, pray to know Jesus, to know God, to get to know him, to have a deeper relationship with him, that we might know him and become like him. Yes, spend time with God's people at church and in Bible study. Don't hear me saying, don't come to church and Bible study. No. Do those things, but don't think it's an automatic fix that if I get to Bible study enough and I tick the box of going to church, that all of a sudden I'm going to fix this. No, come here in order to sit under his word, to do relationships with other people, to encourage each other by speaking the gospel and speaking encouraging words to each other and being encouraged by others. Do it to engage with God and each other that together we might together build each other up in love to become more like Jesus. See, we need to do all these things I said, read the Bible, pray, go to church. We don't just do them as spiritual disciplines, we do them to deepen our relationship with the vine that we might bear much fruit. You see, the temptation in life is, and it's really easy to do, when you see sin that you're really struggling with, I don't know what it's for you, when you see it, you're really struggling with it, you get obsessed by it, don't you? particularly those with a really sensitive conscience. God's got a really sensitive conscience. So you get obsessed by looking at the sin in your life and you focus on it. And our, con our consequence of that is we just try really, really hard to fix it in our own strength. And it seems like that's what God wants us to do because we want to be godly. We're supposed to do that, aren't we? But God says, no. Don't look at your sin. Look at my son. Don't look at your sin. Look at my son. Hebrews says that Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. That is, if we look at Jesus, the author of perfecter of our faith, as we focus on him in his word, as he has revealed to us in a greater and greater way, that we become like him as we see him. Set free by the Spirit to love others. And so, friends, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery, but instead, if we live by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. If you're a Christian tonight, there is no place for thinking, I will never change. That is a lie of Satan. If you ever think that to yourself, just say, shut up, Satan. It's a lie. If you have the Holy Spirit of God, that is at the core of your being and you can change. But don't do it alone. If you're struggling with sin tonight, if there's something that's just got you down, then please come and speak to me. Please speak to Cooper, one of the leaders here. We'd love to pray with you and encourage you to help you walk by the Spirit and enjoy the freedom that he's made you for. Let me pray. Father God, we just want to praise you for your word that makes sense of our reality, that as Christians we are struggling here that we know one day we'll be free from sin completely, but right now we sometimes we just feel still enslaved to it. But Lord, your word tells us that although there is a struggle going on,
between the spirit and the flesh, that that sin is remaining sin and who we truly are is united to Christ, who we truly are has crucified the the flesh and its desires, who we truly are is spirit-empowered people living for Jesus. And so, Father, I pray for each one of these people here tonight, I pray for each one of these people on Facebook, that your spirit would be empowering them, that they would be on their knees daily under your word saying, Jesus, I want to know you that I might become like you, that we would have relational fruit in this church through the power of your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's now time for Q and A questions and answer. We're going to be digging into that with Kurt today. Thanks so much for taking us through this series over the last two weeks, Kurt. Big thing to do to pick apart a topic like this. Um, with the guidance of the entire scriptures. So thanks for doing that with us, brother. No worries. Awesome. So we have one, one question one so far. So this might be a short one. Send them through if you can. Can we get the um, QR code back up? If one, anybody two, else wants one, to send two, one, two. a question. Awesome. Thanks one, so much. Two. Scan away if you can. If the light's not disturbing that too much. It's my... Yeah, it's not. Yeah. Cool. We're live. We're live. Awesome. So... First question, a good question. It's from this morning. Welcome to everybody from AM as well who's uh, joining us for the uh, combined (laughs) Q&A. Relationships require hard work. Doesn't a relationship with God also require work? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a good question. I was just thinking about it when I looked at it then. All right, so how is it different? Um, Relationships are hard work. So I'm not saying don't work hard. I'm just saying don't work alone, I think. So it's the difference between... Um, what, <laughs> when I wake up in the morning, I can think to myself, I've got to be a really, really good person today, all right? So I can work hard to be a really, really good person. But instead, when I wake up in the morning, I think to myself, I've got to work really hard to acknowledge Jesus is here today. I have to work really hard to not live like God's up there and I'm down here doing my own thing. And so one of the ways I do that is get up and go for a walk just to remind myself, and that's hard work. I mean, it's hard to get up every morning and be, you know, be willing to get out of bed and go for a walk for, for 40 minutes. Um, so it's hard, but it's hard relational work. Um, I'm pursuing Jesus. That's my goal. And so that's, that's the difference between what I'm talking about. I'm just saying don't get up and think I'm going to try and be a good person today and maybe I'll meet, I'll, you know, I might talk to God later on, but that'll be one of the things that I try and do to be a good person. The goal is not to be a good person today. The goal is to deepen my relationship with Jesus today. And so that might mean I read his, they'll read, I read his word because that's how he speaks to me and I, I'll spend time talking to him and I might sing about him. And it, does that make sense? So it's relational work. It's still hard, but... Mm, definitely. Thinking about that, how do we read the Bible and pray without making it a chore or mm. chore-like? It's so hard, isn't it? Because... Um, I reckon it'll be different for everyone. So um, as someone in ministry, there's particular struggles, I think, for us in that we can sometimes treat the Bible like it is a instrument to do our job. Um, and so we can read it like, a, we can do it like a comprehension exercise and breaking up the passage and how can we bring it, you know, it becomes a craft rather than the way Jesus speaks to us. So how do you do it? Um, but you've got to figure out how it works for you. So for some people, it might be just not trying to read large slabs of it. Okay? So some people might say, I'm trying to read the Bible in a year. All right, I tend to find when you try to do the Bible in a year, it's a really good thing to do, and it's a good thing to help you have a broader understanding of scriptures. Um, but sometimes it can become the ticker box. I've just got to get it done for this day. Um, and where, is, where possible, I want to try and push against that. And so maybe I do the Bible in a year, but I choose one of the passages to stop and actually just pray through it and just say, God, this, this says to you, this is about you, that you're this. Um, at the moment, I'm really struggling to... So in a sense, use the Bible as a conversation started with the Lord. That's another way to do it as well. Just never read the scriptures without talking to the Lord at the same time because um, that, that's relational by very definition and you bring it to him. So it's as you're reading the scriptures. So you might read through uh, Colossians 1, 2, 6. It says, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus Lord, so walk in him, 
rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, astounding in thanksgiving. And so I might read that and I might say to the Lord, Lord, what does it, what does it look like for me to be rooted and built up in you? Because at the moment, um, I feel like I'm wandering all over the place and I just really need you to, to show me what this looks like. Um, to walk in you, Lord. What does it look like? God, what is it going to look like today? I've got that meeting with so-and-so later on. Help me, to, help me to know what this passage looks like. Do you see? So it becomes this dialogue. It springs forward to a dialogue rather than just be, read that passage, tick, move on. Yeah. That's great. Thanks, Kurt. There are two types of questions that are left. One particularly um, involves change and bearing fruit but it also has to do with backsliding and reversing. So I'll read out the question. Yeah. Thinking of change and bearing fruit, can a genuine Christian backslide and reverse the changes? Um, yes. Because, um, I mean, people, you'll know that's the case. Um, it's, hard, it's, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Like, the reality is we don't know where remaining sin is in us. And oftentimes, the reason we don't know how deep it goes in us is because we haven't been in a context that's brought it out of us. So the metaphor often uses the sponge. So if you have a sponge and it's full of water, if you look at the sponge, all right, you look at it and think, oh, I can't see any water. What happens when you squeeze it? You see water come out. And so life often squeezes us in new and wonderful ways and then something comes in, sin comes into our lives, and we could look like we've gone backwards in the Christian life because we're sinning in ways now that we've never sinned before, but it's because we've never been squeezed in that way before. And so, for example, I have one kid, all right, and I, I think I'm pretty patient, pretty patient, pretty uh, loving. Then I have two kids, squeezed just that little bit more, and I think, oh, maybe I'm not so patient. Then I have three, and I just, I'm just like, bugger like it just it feels like everything's been squeezed out of me all this sin comes out of me i'm angry i'm frustrated i'm impatient i'm i think i think to myself constantly how come it's all about the kids and not me why doesn't wife pay more attention to me now was i that sinful back then well, yeah i just hadn't been squeezed in that way yet you see so remaining sin is a bit tricky and so it could feel like i'd backslidden at that point but i haven't but the thing is that god's grace is bigger so that squeezing process of God is actually the means through which he grows you more like Christ. Because it's as though sin comes out of me, as the water pours out of me, my sin comes out and I think, man, I didn't know it was that simple. Then I'm, I realise his grace is so much bigger. I realise how much his forgiveness is and I want to live for him more and more. His mercy just seems greater. So when I got saved, I thought, Jesus, I thought oh, Jesus saved me from sin, isn't that great? But now, when, now, 20 years on, and I can see all the ways God has squeezed me and, and revealed the remaining sin that was still in me. Uh, I, you know, that's one of the reasons I raise my hands when I sing now. It's because I just, man, I, it's all grace. Like, I'm just, um, I'm moved by the fact of how much, how big his forgiveness is in a way that I don't think I was when I, even when I first got saved. Praise God, he's worked that change. Yeah. So this is probably going to be the last question. It has to do with understanding and change in the Christian life. So if I'm not changing, even after years and years of trying, have I not understood the gospel or something? Um, I, I want to push on that. Like I want to say, I want to push on the fact that it is gradual. Um, I want to say it's gradual. So um, it might take a really long time. At the same time, I want to say that it is the work of God's Spirit. Now, I don't want to say God keeps us in our sin. I think there's a degree to which God will allow things to remain in our lives that might weaken us, that we might depend more on Him. Now, we don't know what... Paul's thorn in the flesh was in 2 Corinthians, where he says uh, he cried out three times to the Lord to take away this thorn in his flesh. So it's a metaphor. So we don't, it's about 15 different ideas of what it is. Um, 
And so we're not really sure what it is, but it's this idea that in the end God says to him, my grace is sufficient for you because my power is made perfect in weakness. And so I want to presume that that could be, it could be possibly true about sin as well. If you haven't had victory over it, it, you, it doesn't mean that you will not, but don't get discouraged that you're not a Christian um, if you are continuing to trust Christ in the midst of it and understand your forgiveness in him, that's the thing that reveals that you have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the person without the Spirit, sees their sin they, and then just turns away from Christ. They just think, stuff it. I mean, they just don't turn to Christ. They can't because they don't see his grace at all. But if you're even going on and still struggling with it, you've just got to keep bringing it to him, realising his grace and recognise that the Holy Spirit... Uh, it's gradual. But at the same time, hold to the truth that it's inevitable. It's inevitable. And you can have victory over it. But often I find people who are struggling with things like that are usually doing it pretty alone. And so if, if you are struggling with that sin by yourself, then you are short-circuiting one of God's means for helping you in that, and that is his community. And so don't struggle away with this secret sin by yourself, share it with others that they might pray for you, that you might together around God's word be grown in community. We might call it there on that note and we're about to head to one of those opportunities to do just that. So if you want an opportunity to chat, feel free to chat with Kurt or I, someone you trust or with people down at the beach. Um, really encourage you to do that. Just a reminder, we're meeting down at Maroubra um, for dinner by your own. Um, and we'll see you down there. Well, over this last two weeks, we've seen that all who are in the Lord Jesus are free. He has set us free. And Jesus has saved us from sin and everything that it causes. And he's saved us to trust in Jesus and to live a life of love towards others in the power of his Holy Spirit. So, I thought we'd say a eyes open prayer for once. Not that we're praying to one another but just so we can concentrate in this new way. So, as we finish up, let's pray together. Loving God, we thank you for hearing our prayers and feeding us with your word. Take us and use us to serve you and all people in love, in the power of your Holy Spirit, and in the name of your Son, Jesus our King. Amen. Alrighty, feel free to turn around, chat with the people around you. Walk around, keep you 1.5, and then we'll see each other down at Maroubra Beach after that.